Hello everyone and welcome to the next edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosen Apostolov and I will be today's host. So as you know, Gromox is one of the most widely used applications for molecular dynamic simulations and it's uh, my pleasure to have today Paul Bauer who is uh, working on many aspects of the uh, Gromox uh, usability and he will tell us more about how you are able to contribute to the Gromox code and the documentation. For those of you who are uh, new to our webinar series, I'd like to give a very brief overview of BioExcel and uh, what we do. BioExcel is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. We are almost three years old by now. Our three main uh, lines of activity are first, the improvement of performance, efficiency and scalability of several key applications which are extensively used in biomolecular research. These are Gromox, which you know very well about. Hadoop, which is one very popular application for docking, for integrative modeling. And also CPMD, which is extensively used for hybrid QM MM simulations of, for example, enzymatic systems. In addition to the key applications, we will also work on improving the usability uh, of uh, these codes and also coupling them with various other tools. We do, do this by uh, devising efficient uh, workflows that uh, let researchers in, in one go execute complex pipelines, for example, that are needed by their research. And we work with key workflow platforms such as Galaxy, Combs, 9 Apache Taverna, and a few others. Our center also puts a lot of effort in consultancy and training, and we are promoters of best practices in the training of end users, not only in the applications, but also how to write code, um, and so software engineering best practices and others. So I'd like to introduce uh, our presenter today, Paul Bauer. He received his PhD in computational chemistry um, last year at Uppsala University while working with Professor Lynn Kamerlin on computational understanding of enantioselective enzyme catalysis. And uh, although his main part of the doctoral work was uh, also experimental work, he started working on software development where they were developing in-house simulation software. After his PhD, Paul took a position as a researcher and scientific programmer at Elip Lindos Group. And uh, for the last year, he's been uh, extensively contributing to Gromox, working with the infrastructure, improving the documentation. And uh, he's the best person to tell us about how to contribute to Gromox and uh, why do it and what's the best way. So welcome. Paul. Thank you, Watson, and thank you for the introduction and giving me the opportunity to Share this talk with the people that are interested in it in the form of the BioExcel webinar series. During the talk, I will go through a few uh, general questions about logs, how to contribute to the code, and especially why you should con or contribute if possible. I will give you an introduction to the GOMAX documentation that has intensive information on that to find um, the information how to contribute and what. You have to, to consider before contributing. I will go through a few examples that I think work very well during the last year where internal and external contributors used our existing documentation to provide us with new functionality and updates to our software. And I will finish with a few sessions on general advice for users, contributors, and, and the like on what they should consider and do if they want to contribute to projects in general, and what is in general a bad idea if they want to contribute because um, <clears throat> they lead to uh, hassles for the developers and also for the people that are contributing. So, to the question why contribute the code? This is something many people ask themselves when they see a large uh, software project, especially one that has been established for several years and that has a few core, core developers that know best what to do. A lot of people then think there are other people, external people think there are main developers working on it. They know what they're doing, so I shouldn't bother. 
Also, it's often in the case with complex codes. Gromitz is one of them, but there are even more um, visible examples of this, for example, in the Linux kernel. Where it's often the idea of new people that they think they don't have enough expertise to actually do something in the code and they would just be a drag on others. It can also be that they had tried to um, contribute to different projects or even the same project before, and they got harsh review on their contributions. People didn't like them possible for, or they didn't like what has been done, and they feel that their effort had been wasted. Their um, contributions were not acknowledged, and they think that after a few years of not, nothing being done, uh, they shouldn't even try to do anything anymore. In my opinion, this is uh, a set of wrong assumptions, because there's always good reasons to contribute to whatever project you can think about. It could be just uh, fixing a very small issue that you had found by using the software, and that's annoying you. Maybe it's just a type on the output, it is a missing comma in the documentation, or a hassle in the user interface where you need to put extra options that you don't think are needed. Could also be that you have been an that you are an expert in the kind of development for the application and you know how to improve it, you know a performance improvement, and you can prove it. And then, of course, you should contribute this at some point. It could be that you're working on new ways to analyze data that is produced by a program or by other software. And you want to include this analysis method to the software and you want to make sure that it can be. <coughs> uh, that you want to include improve the analysis me method that to be a, gen a simple part of the code. And of course, it's always possible that you want to improve documentation because you found something that was unclear that was explained to you, but has not been updated in the uh, documentation itself. And then, of course, you can contribute and fix this. <clears throat> so how to do this and what you should think about when you decide that you want to contribute to any project. First, as a general advice, you always need to have a good idea of what you want to do and what you are planning with, planning with your changes, how those changes should, should look like. You should have worked out the requirements of what is needed for whatever you want to implement or what you want to change. And also reduce the scope of, your, of the possible change as much as possible because it's always more difficult to implement something that is itself big, that is maybe hundreds of thousand lines of code changes, and it does everything that you can think of at once. That usually is not what is needed. What is needed is a test case that shows that this feature does work as it should, in a very simple case without any additional even performance improvement aspects. And of course, always, if you want to change something, you should have tested it before that it actually works and does what it does. It does what it's supposed to be doing, and it doesn't do anything else. It doesn't interfere with the rest of the running of the program, and doesn't, for example, um, hinder performance as much, too much. So, if you want to contribute, for example, to Gromex and how to contribute, there are a few sample places that I will also introduce to you. Those are garrettgromex.org. This is our code review server that is also linked to our um, integrated testing infrastructure. We have a Redmine issue tracker, redmine.gromex.org, that is used to um, keep track of what we want to do with the code, current bugs that we know of or that users have found, tasks to improve um, aspects of the code, and features that should be implemented are kept track there. Hmm. Other impo important um, resources are our user mailing list, where general questions about programs are usually asked by people that use it. And usually you can find any information, like right? lots of questions that have been answered or <clears throat> that have already been answered can be also searched by looking through the archives of the mailing list. And we also have a developer mailing list that is focused on uh, developer questions on questions that are actually related to code development and uh, what should be changed in, for example, new versions of the code. And also we can get information about new versions, new features, new releases and our plans for the future. So, as I said, a short overview. What you see right now is actually a picture of our code reviews site from yesterday morning. They see that uh, currently working on a few changes to the code that are all public and can be reviewed by external people and internal people. 
allowing us to vote and judge their code for correctness. And it turns to our coding standards and also if they follow the general um, general general um, vision of the project in the end. This um, uh, infrastructure, the, the server is our central infrastructure is linked to our automated testing system that allows us to verify each submission to it to see if it passes our tests on different um, build systems, for example, different versions of compilers, different versions of um, uh, subsidiary, subsidiary software such as CUDA, and also if it works on different versions of operation systems to, to make sure it works on Linux, Mac, and Windows in the end. Now our central uh, information infrastructure is our issue tracker. This is a red mine. You see that all issues that have been filed by users are kept track of and can, can be searched and investigated by people that want to know, for example, which bugs could recently fix new version. You have this information also in the documentation in the release notes, but sometimes it can be also important to see what actually got done. And the advantage of the issue tracker is that it also links to the changes in the repository and in on the uh, on Garrett, allowing us to quickly cross-reference changes to uh, issues, features, and, and tasks, to make it possible to see when a task, for example, is completed and the issue can be closed, or to see if a bug got fixed recently and can be also checked by users that reported the bug. So after you have gone to these pages and informed yourself about what you wanted to do, then if you still think that your project idea is good, what you're calling on here, it's usually a good idea to contact one of the core developers on the mailing list. You can find those developers as simply the most active people on either Redmine or Geralt and contact them directly if you have an idea. But it's in general also a good idea to post it to the wider mailing list to see what is the consensus of other people that maybe are not core developers, but they're invested in the because of the software. After the discussion there, the, the discussion move usually moves over to Redmine uh, with a new issue that can be discussed. There can be, uh, can be important feedback to show how the code should be tackled. And you can get some ideas, for example, how to improve your general concept or how to reduce the scope of the, of the problem that you're working on. After this, after the discussion there, it comes just the housekeeping part. You need to have your own test repository, you need to be able to build the software, and you need to, of course, do the necessary task of preparing for the preparing tests for what will be changed by your uh, new feature that you're implementing to make sure, as I said before, that it does actually what it's supposed to be doing. <clears throat> This is the point where you usually upload your change to Garrett, and this can be also the point where you have to prepare for some frustration that is inherent to shared software development. Because a change that is uploaded to Garrett, as I said, will be viewable and can be reviewed by everyone on the server. And code review in programmers usually tends to be, be very on point to keep up our software standard, standards, but also helpful. We try to help new people and also core developers to improve their code to always get something better out of it and help to uh, reduce the scope for future bugs so they are not hidden, hidden because something was implemented for them. It can be quite possible that any that the change you're doing, if, especially if it involves some changes to core parts of comments, to go for a large number of reviews that can go as large as 60 or 70 even in a few weeks if multiple people have interest and are invested in your change and want to, make, want to make sure that it adheres to our standards in the end. It can even be that if some people think that your change is not up to our standards or that it is um, maybe not, opti not the optimal way to implement a new feature, that it's initially rejected. And then you have to consider it and see from the feedback that you got how you could restart the implementation. You could um, see uh, that you upload a new change that takes those considerations into account first. That goes then again for the ones of code review and will likely be accepted. Now, it's also important that you have to think that developers, core developers are humans, and 
they also can be frustrated by, by their work. More on this on what you should be doing and what you should not be doing to reduce frustration on all sides will be mentioned later. But uh, just a few main points. It's not a good idea usually to upload large changes to the code without any context. If we see that someone uploads 20,000 lines of code without any reference to Redmond, even though if this is the most beautiful layer of code with beautiful documentation, it's likely it won't be accepted because we need to have a discussion about it first. Another bad thing is to not have tested your changes before and, and seeing that everything you try to do suddenly fails in our testing infrastructure. This means that we have to go, have to go through um, the changes before again. And it keeps at all time that we uh, know that by your stuff is getting tested and we're like a pass. Other people cannot test their code themselves. Also, we have an extensive information about coding style and coding standards. And the uh, new code should always adhere to this style to make, uh, make sure that there's not that much noise about, um, yeah, you should change the style, your coding style to the standard that we have agreed on. But you can start with this from the beginning. Now, everything that I just talked of, you can actually read about in our documentation. And the government's documentation is basically your source for everything that you need to start your own development, that you need to start your own work with comments, and that you need to, that you can go through to get more knowledge about the backgrounds, about the physic, physical assumptions that are used with comments, and what kinds of model implements. Comments documentation itself has been recently given to be hopefully more accessible to users and contains, as I said, info on information on how to compile the code, what it can do, but has always been a work in progress and has always been on the stage of it can be improved, it should be updated more, but there's usually not enough time for it. Currently, the documentation is um, available both as an online web page where you can get information about downloading the code. You have the release notes for the different versions. You have an installation guide, user guide, some hard tools for beginners, and a few other sections for, uh, for example, the reference manual, the developer guides, and even full code documentation from Doxygen. You also have most of this um, available as a PDF. But I, we think that it is better to have it actually available as a web page that can, that can be crossed in easily. In the documentation, the uh, different sections are split up according to the topic. The user guide provides information for end up user people that are new to simulation software, new to Gomex itself, and gives you an idea of what the software can do, answers some frequently asked questions, and gives you some. Uh, also some extended, extended information for how you should manage simulations and what should be what you should think about before stopping them. The reference manual is the uh, holy bible of simulation with Gromex because it explains everything that is in it for what kind of assumptions you make, what kind of physical model, what kind of physics are modeled, how the model, how physics is modeled, what kind of different methods are available and how those methods are implemented. The developer guide, uh, on the other hand, contains more the information on what you can do if you want to implement your own tools, what you can do to get an idea for contributing to Gromex, for example. There you find uh, the contribute to Gromex section. I think this is probably of most interest for people that are joining here. There you have the, the checklist. There you have um, some ideas for sub submitting code to Gromex. We also give you some ideas of, for example, if you have a change that is likely not going to be accepted or you think maybe there is not enough interest in it. For you to fork the Gromex repository, keep track on our current um, stable versions, but keep have your codes in a separate repository in the end. <clears throat> you have to find, I hope you can all see those um, links here, or uh, you can just Google for them in the end. And find the user guide, uh, reference manual, and other sections of the manual that are released for the current beta version, all online. And can also browse them if you're interested in it at some point. 
as I mentioned before, you also have full code documentation for everything that is currently in documented in Linux, and it's only been more, more completed with the new version. Um, the uh, Doxygen documentation unit here. You can also get all of this from directly from the manual Linux.org documentation headpage where you find documentation not only for the current beta version, but also for all the previous stable versions and also the current in development version that is just the daily build from our master branch. So now to some examples that I will just introduce you for how code can be contributed to Linux. And I will do first a shameless plug because I'm going to show my first project that was related to Linux, and that was a rework actually of the documentation. Initially, documentation in Linux was always handled as two separate um, pieces. You had the online documentation, that was user guide, install guide, and developer manual. And there was the reference menu that was an external PDF that contained the physics. Those kind of, this kind of split made it actually difficult to relate to the different sections to each other because you needed to always have both of them separately at hand. And it also meant there was additional work needed to keep them in, in sync. If something got changed in the user guide on managing simulations, the respective section also had to be kept in sync with the reference manual and vice versa, making it more prone to errors. There are also several other pages from previous versions of Gomez that contained some information, but they were not kept up to date and also difficult to access in the end. My process to change this was initially actually learn how our infrastructure works, how, for example, our automated test, how the code review system works, and how a built environment for the documentation should be set up to test that the documentation that actually works. Then the uh, following parts, they are actually what you would expect. See that the new changes to the documentation can be accepted and to upload the change to the, uh, the server that test, tests it, following by after a while approval from the other developers. <laughs> the result of this was actually what you saw in the link section from the new beta version, is that the format got um, from the documentation got, for the documentation got unified. Now it is all uh, available as RST markup, or if someone is not familiar, it's restructured text markup. <coughs> this allows us to both provide HTML documentation that we have now on our page, and also allows us to um, build uh, the PDF version from the same source material, meaning that we only have to keep track of one of them in the end. Another advantage of changing this to one, basically one unified documentation is that we can now cross-reference between all different parts and make it easy for users to uh, see uh, what the, what the um, simulation, for example, use of a specific simulation method means in terms of the physics explained in the reference manual. Another result was that we were further able to duplicate some of the older web pages that are out of sync. And we're also planning to have the uh, documentation as well as the Gong's binary registered with unique digital object unifiers, make it possible for users to always refer to the version of documentation that they used from a release. Release and not, not having any ambiguity about this. Another example that we had from uh, working from an external contributor was some updates to the GMX cluster tool. There, uh, some discussion started on the developer list and later on Redman from someone that saw that there were actually some missing functionalities in the tool that he thought should be easy to, easy to fix and could be of use with, or could be of a lot of use to other people. The discussion on Redman led to him uploading a patch to build it and this worked working without any trouble. With the other developers then helping in cleaning up this patch, reviewing it, and leading to it to be submitted in the latest release. Another example was updates to puppet detection. That was actually a student from come a student contacted us in the developer team for a project to get started with software development and get um, started with working, for example, in the Linux community. 
among some of the developers, it was then decided that one possible, ah, see, type, type one, sorry. So um, uh, that's one part that could be updated in the moment would be the hardware detection library, HW, WH4. That is used to detect what kind of system Linux is running on to get the best um, performance improvement possible from it. The student also worked on uh, getting to know our um, code, code the system and the um, automated testing tools by working on some smaller issues again in the documentation. And successfully was able to uh, upload a patch that was agreed on by the different developers to support new, a new version, library version of the hardware detection library in concert with support for the older version. That led to actually some issues later that were identified and that were fixed by the other developers. And the contributor is still active in the community and helps both with um, working on new features in CodeView, showing that this is actually quite easy to get integrated in the developer community and be active at uh, be active in the project. <coughs> so what all of those um, different examples had in common was that people that wanted to contribute got involved in the community. That means actually helping with the software development of it. It not just means uploading code to Garrett and fixing things, improving documentation, but also helping in game and other people's changes. It means spending time to go and go into code that you may think that you understand, but you think you can help with you. And suggesting how suggesting how it can improve, or saying this works as a should, it could should be included. It also means that people should be active or can be active on the users and developer and mailing this to help people with issues with running the program or with um, developer questions itself. A very important thing is also that you should not first start with trying to fix the uh, interesting thing you're working on. But maybe fix with some, pick something small first to get better to know what the what is in the code base, how the different systems work, how a code review usually works, and how to quickly get code accepted. Another thing is that it's always good to be actually active on our issue tracker and our code review server itself, because it means that you care about the state of the program. If someone just uploads a change and expects us to fix it in the future after it got the put center got accepted in the code, it's very likely that it will be duplicated in a short time because no one will have the knowledge, know-how, and time to actually continue to work on it. It's always good to actually care about also other people's codes, trying to find errors, trying to find possible improvements, and try trying to prevent bugs before they happen. But what should be mentioned, and what is always uh, an important part of the uh, being active in the developer community, is that code review and discussion on that man Garrett, user mailing list, developer mailing list, should be followed to keep up our coding standards, to keep up the aim of the project, and most importantly, to keep the physics correct, so maintenance, to make sure that people can continue to do awesome science with our comments. But you need to stay civil and kind. You need to be able to show people how to improve their code without being abusive to them or being neglectant of their, of their own ideas. So if you find an issue with someone else's code, it, you should point it out to them. You should say this can be improved, not this is just wrong. Just as important are things that definitely shouldn't be done. And this is almost all the time just being inconsiderate with anything that you want to change. Time for developers is finite. You can only, during the day, you can only work 24 hours and then there's the night. But developers still cannot spend all day reviewing the change. They have their own projects to run, they have other commitments to work, work on. And reviewing a launch change takes time. It cannot be done within 30 minutes while something else is happening or while you have downtime from other people. It takes a lot of time to get into the code to understand what has happened and also to um, get an idea of what was meant to be done in general. Another problem is that our testing infrastructure is also limited, has limited resources. 
For example, right now for a single change depends our verification on the current development branch. It takes about 22 to 24 minutes for all systems to be freed again. This means if someone uploads 10 different changes that should all be reviewed or should all be checked by our testing system that for more than three hours, no one else can do anything. So it's not a, not a good idea to just upload, even if you have changes, even if they are small and can maybe easily be reviewed. If you will block our people from contributing at the same time. This also means that you should definitely check on whatever hardware that is available to you that your code will pass to make sure that uh, the um, testing infrastructure is not used to build the binary, test it in some cases, and then having it fail in most of the other cases, wasting a very much time in the code review. And it's also very important to listen to the advice that you actually get from other developers, especially from the senior developers. If they think that your code can be improved, then it probably can and you should take it into consideration, get updated to new coding styles, to different constructs in C++, for example, and try to implement the changes as good as you can. And another thing that sometimes come up is that you see extremely large changes uploaded as once. And yeah, the headlines is that all 20,000 plus lines changes are a bad idea. Because they will make it, make it difficult for review. You can see how large it changes that is uploaded and the 20,000 plus line change will probably scare away even the hard, most hardened developer that is used to reviewing a lot of code at once. This kind of code hides a lot of complexity also because you usually forget what was done in the first file after your, when you're touching and going through file 355. Meaning that there is, if there's a subtle bug that is hidden and the, is because of some strange combination of input method and assumption data on the top, it will be very hard to find. And this kind of changes also mean that probably a lot of parts of the code are touched and modified at once making it more and more difficult to understand and validate what is happening in the change. Again, this will lead to bugs. It may lead to one result in the simulation. What is that for everyone that wants to use the software? So it leads to papers being retracted, work having to be done again, computer resources being wasted. So if you want to have large changes, you usually have to see those, as I mentioned in the beginning, that you can reduce the scope as much as possible and then add more and more different aspects to the code after it has been validated to do what it's supposed to be doing, after corner cases have been identified and properly accounted for. And it has been shown that there's no negative impact on the rest of the code. This concludes the presentation part and I want to thank some people that are involved in my current work. This is, of course, the project leads for Gromex, especially Eric Lindner, Beth Hessen, Mark Abraham in Stockholm, as well as everyone in, in Cyberplan that is working on Gromex or working with Gromex. And of course, I want to thank all developers and contributors to Gromex and all the users that continue to do awesome science with it. And that shows that they're doing something that is worthwhile. And with this, I want to thank everyone and we will go over to the questions and answers session. Thank you, Paul, for the very thorough explanation. And uh, yes, so now we have the questions and answers session open. Please use the questions tab in the control panel to uh, write your questions. Um, we don't have at the moment yet, uh, so please use it. Uh, so we also, Gromox website is under new development. Uh, yes. When can we expect to see a new? Website? So the main website, because there is still um, the, some of the older information that is difficult to migrate from it, we are, we still will keep it. But in general, we think that most of the different pages should redirect to the manual performance.org/slash documentation page because we have now all the information about the project centralized there and easily accessible, for example, the different versions of the program. 
download links for every relevant version, as well as the links to our different development infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, uh, a, a lot of effort is being put in the, in the code and uh, so for mm -hmm. the infrastructure, it requires even, even more. Um, so if, if there are questions from the audience, please uh, use the questions tab. Uh, we have a question by Adam. Hi there, yes. Um, so I was, uh, there's a clear explanation of uh, how to how to contribute kind of if I if I already sort of know the area in which I want to, to contribute what what would you advise is the, the best way to to learn about the parts of the code that are most extensible you know to, to learn about kind of the architecture of the codes the parts that can be changed for example without modifying the central part of the code that makes it difficult to test you know for in your opinion if there are what areas of the code or what aspects of it are most uh, accessible for for uh, improvements and modifications so one area is of course the uh, documentation if people want to change something then to get started is always a good idea to look at the documentation and change something there Another, another area, in my opinion, is quite easily accessible is our um, framework for analysis methods. Because we also provide a template that people can modify to implement their own method and to learn how the analysis framework works in the end. Otherwise, um, to find out how different parts of the software work, I think that the Doxygen documentation is very well structured and informative to get started on different aspects that are of interest to the user. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so we have a question by uh, Jisun Lee, uh, apologies for the pronunciation, let's see if we can get uh, an audio connection. Hi, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear. Ah, great. So you're welcome to ask your question. Yeah, I, I, I want to know, will Gromax consider to support multi-body potential such as EAM used for metro stimulation? What's uh, kind of... What do you mean with multiple potential? Because I'm, I, don't, I don't think I'm that familiar with uh, this kind of approach. I'm sorry. Do you mean uh, different potentials for... Um, so like three body uh, or three body something potentials? like that? Yeah. yeah. Because, think... if, uh, because I, I, if I want to do some simulation about material, sometimes Gromax can't, did not support the some potential, so I cannot use it. So I'm wondering if Garmax will consider to support this potential. I don't think there are any plans right now to support this kind of potential in Romax. There is work on um, providing better support actually for human approaches to um, maybe provide, provide um, something that is closer to this kind of approach. But for direct implementation of a multi-body potential, I don't think there's anything planned at the moment. Okay, okay, thank you. It, uh, actually, it's a little difficult. It's not easy to implement new potential straight straight away without affecting performance. And uh, this, is, this they they touch on the very core parts of the of the code, so it, it's not uh, easy to moment at least to extend it such like lumps for example they, they support different potentials but this comes at the expense of performance so uh, in Gromax there is support for user-defined potentials using uh, tables of interactions strength and forces if I yeah, and forces so it is possible to have your own uh, user-defined potentials that you can use for simulating the system okay okay thank you but these you need to tabulate yes, before they need, to, they need to be tabulated beforehand. Yeah. 
and they usually don't are not able to use the full extent of the performance economics that is available for the already implemented potentials. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have other questions? Uh, we still have time. Can you please use the control panel? Well, uh, if there's no more questions, what well, would be the best way to get in touch with uh, you? Paul, just drop your email. If if somebody's uh, maybe hesitating, if it's a, a new user and is you know, a little unsure whether they have actually found a, a bug or something needs to be changed, then uh, I suppose everybody's welcome to everybody's contribute. Everybody's welcome right? to contribute. And the thing is, if you think you found a bug, then I think you should let us know. If, if you think something is unexpected behavior in the software, then it most likely is unexpected behavior. And even if it's not, we maybe have to explain better why the software behaves in the way that you were not expecting it to. Yeah, it really helps to get an outside view of uh, how information is presented and, uh, as well. We have this problem in, as developers that we often we see what we are working on and we see yeah, what, we, what we are doing and what, what we are used to. But we don't know, we don't always know how people use the software. So yeah, you tend to develop like yeah, a blind eye yes, for, yes. for some, I think that's right. So if people use it for interesting science that we didn't think about. They need to let us know yeah. if something doesn't behave as they think it should. Well, that's true also for all other community yeah, projects. It's uh, always true. Yeah. Uh, well, but Gromax has a big user community, so it has a big opportunity yes. to improve uh, quickly. Uh, all right. Well, since we don't have other questions, uh, with that, uh, we can close today's presentation. Uh, as I said, we will upload the recording of the webinar on the BioXL YouTube channel and on the website. So you're welcome to uh, watch it again or forward it to your friends and colleagues. And uh, just to let you know that uh, coming up next in the Bugsta webinar series, we have two presentations. One is on one high-level framework, the COMP says, and it's Python uh, variant PyComps, which uh, is Extensively used for development of parallel applications will be presented by Daniel Letzi from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And for especially for the Gromax users and our listeners today, uh, in November, in a, in a month's time, we have a presentation by Michael Gert, who will talk about MD Benchmark, uh, a new uh, system for easy benchmarking of your code, something that is very important for everybody who is using in particular large-scale resources uh, that can help you find the optimum uh, way to, to run your simulations without uh, using too much uh, compute cycles in vain. So everyone is welcome to register and join us for these webinars. I'd like to thank all the um, participants for joining today and uh, Paul for the great talk. Thank you for having me. And uh, yes, we will see you again next time. Thank you, and that will be all for today. Bye.